Hey guys, I'm Fancy. And I'm Colleen. And this is Murder by Design. by design I'm obviously your guest uh, your your host fancy um, tonight I'm a lone wolf but I've got Stephen David Lampley with us one of our very favorite guests uh, he's a retired SVU detective and homicide detective he's done serial killer profiling and so tonight that's why we have him on is all of this plays into the case we're gonna talk about tonight so tonight we're going to be talking about the Golden State Killer. As you know, um, D'Angelo has finally, you know, just just entered his plea agreement. And uh, that's all kind of gone through the courts. We were kind of side, um, you know, sideswiped by that. We were all were not expecting that to go through as quickly as it did. But um, so that's what we've got him on here tonight. Uh, thank you, Stephen, so much for joining us. Well, thank you for so, having me. It's always a pleasure. We, we love having you. We, we, we love having all of our guests. You know, you guys are such a great, great little bunch of people that we've, we've gotten connected with. Um, we're also going to start talking with uh, Dr. Laura Petler coming up here now, too. She's joining the, the group of you guys. So I'm really excited about having her on. And uh, I think it's Karen Stark as well. So we're going to we're really excited. We're kind of rounding out who we're having here. So very exciting. So um, so starting off here, so D'Angelo admitted to 161 crimes involving 48 people. And it was something that prosecutors were very adamant about including a confession to the other crimes. Because as rapes, many of his earlier crimes had run out of the statute of limitations. So have you ever seen a case with this many counts inside of a plea bargain or even a big serial killer case and is it even something that you've seen done like this i never have i never have and this is uh this is of course is a tremendous case and it's a tremendous victory for dna uh as yeah. well as as justice but i've never seen anything at least personally or, or actively worked in anything that was this uh involved uh, right. as, as, the, as the garden state killer is yeah i don't think that I, I really don't think I've ever seen anything with this many counts, even within like a, you know, Ted Bundy wasn't tried for this many that, you know, right. even Sam Little, all the ones that I think of that have done many, many, many things have not been tried for this many cases, especially the rapes. And I thought that was interesting. So based on the case like this, where at least 50 rapes were linked to him at the time, referred to as the East Area Rapist or the original Night Stalker. Do you think that the statute of limitations on rape or violent assault should be changed? Because that's part of the reason why we weren't able to get, you know, they, they included them in the plea agreement, but they weren't able to try them on many of them if they had gone to trial. It was the, I think it was the, they called it the pre-1917, excuse me, the pre-2017 or whatever that was, mm -hmm. uh, what year, uh, mm -hmm. that they couldn't go back beyond that. I've always been of the opinion, of course, we have murder, we have other things that, that uh, bypass that. It's always been my opinion, and, and my opinion uh, alone, probably, I don't know that everybody would agree with me, that violent crimes such as violent assault, aggravated assault, rape, uh, manslaughter, anything like that should, should have no statute of limitations. Yeah, uh, I agree, to too. I agree too. And I think that for me, I almost feel like rape or like these violent assaults, um, they are, um, in my opinion, it's almost worse than murder because in murder, that person is dead. They don't know what happened. You know, they, they've gone on. It, it's hard for the families. I understand the families have to live with it and the loss of their loved ones. But when you're thinking of rape and assault, you know, you're leaving that person dead inside, but they're alive. You know, yeah, they're because, having to live with that every day. Yeah, and and so I just don't see how it's it's right to put a statute of limitations on that. You know, um, child molestation is another one that I don't think there should be a statute of limitations. Once a person, you know, comes forward and is is able to talk about it, I think that that, you know, that's there should be no no limitation on that, especially if it's like you know it's connected to something like this where we've got fifty cases you know, that finally through DNA evidence and everything were, were brought to justice, you know. So, um, 
six counties actually headed up the prosecution team. Um, have you ever seen a multi-jurisdictional case like that? Like no, that many counties? Of course, he moved. He moved around his locations, his rapes in one place, and he, he was. He started like most serial killers, though. He started at a very young age, mm -hmm. uh, theft, and and building upon the, the simple theft and, and everything that he did. Mm -hmm. uh, so this has been going on a number of decades, not mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. it's a right. number of decades. This has been going on. So right. it involved a lot of crime. It involved a lot of murders, a lot of rapes, and a lot of jurisdictions. Right. So looking at the facts of the case, how would you have profiled this case? Um, you know, I know you do a lot of serial profiling. So how would you have come down with that profile? What would you have put into well, it? What would you have thought of? I'll, I'll be honest. I do not know what they knew. I, I didn't follow this case very closely uh, mm -hmm. throughout the years, uh, as I don't a lot of serial killer cases. I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert on all of them whatsoever. Uh, right. But knowing what I know now and what I've read, Mm -hmm. uh, he did, uh, D'Angelo did spend a wealth of time uh, scoping out the victims, taking, he was mm -hmm. very, very organized, very yes. organized in what he did and picking out his victims. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he did, and, and like an organized serial killer, he did have transportation. He had employment, even as a police officer for a period mm -hmm. of time, mm -hmm. for a period of time. So uh, given that, that that should have helped narrow it down and it did to a great mm -hmm. degree but you mm -hmm. still just in the case of jeffrey dahmer for instance mm -hmm. you you have it narrowed down on who you're looking for but you still got to have the proof and the evidence and with jeffrey there was no evidence the victims were destroyed so to speak Right. Uh, so yeah, they that they they knew who this was. They knew who they were looking for. But you've got to be able to link a person to the crime, which of course in this case DNA eventually did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in our last episode with Kirk Nurmi, a viewer had asked us if a specific kill or crime would be more likely to be more exciting to. To a to a, a killer. So, based on what you know of profiling um, and serial killers, what do you think of that question? What do you, what do you think about that? Well, it depends on on the, the the motive behind the serial killer. If you've got a serial killer that is is motivated by sex, then yeah, or or motivated by just the simple killing of a person, uh, mm -hmm. such as usually an organ an organized serial killer is, they're just they're just excited. They they're just excited for the kill. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's opposed, again, I keep saying Jeffrey Dahmer, because Jeffrey Dahmer was unique, uh, mm -hmm. was a unique serial killer in some respects. So even though we have a profile, that doesn't mean that this person is going to fit 100% sure. all of the characteristics in that particular profile. Uh, and how do you guys come, across, come into the, the decisions that you make? What are you looking at when you're profiling? Exactly. Well, the first thing, when, when I go, and I, I'm going to simplify this probably way, way too much, but when I, I, t I go to forensic classes in high school, uh, mm -hmm. usually every year, and mm -hmm. part of the presentation that I have is, first of all, I want to get their interest. I want to keep their interest in the class, but mm -hmm. I also want to develop their interest in forensic sciences as well. So right. I've always believed in the I won't say shock value, but give them something interesting that they probably don't know. So what I do is when I go into these classes, I will uh, I will give them a very brief uh, course, if you will, maybe 20 minutes of it, on serial killer profiling. And one of the things I do is I have a picture of a crime scene that I put up there and I let them study it for 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. And then I ask them questions about that uh, picture. Mm -hmm. And... I ask them questions that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, they have no clue and no, are not able to answer. One of the questions, for instance, is what kind of employment does the serial killer's father likely have? Right. And they're like, they, they look at me like a dog looking at, hearing a strange noise. <laughs> what? How? Yeah. So <laughs> one of the things we do, and one of the things I teach them is look at the crime scene. Look at what you have. When you get to the crime scene, look at it very quickly. And you can look at a crime scene within seconds and get a good idea of who you're looking for. Not right. who necessarily is in name, but the, but the suspect type you're looking for. Uh, sure. 
for instance, if you have a if you have a messy crime scene, you've got a body, you've got the weapon, you're probably going to have a disorganized serial killer as opposed to if you have a crime scene where there's blood and the, there's nothing turned over or nothing destroyed, you're probably and that's very that's very simplistic. Well, right. we're, going to look, we're going to look at the crime scene and then we're going to go from there. So there's a definitive process that you go through. Mm -hmm. And he explains a lot of this, guys, in his um, tip. Uh, Stephen has, and what you can see behind him there is the Oliphant Institute um, logo. And he explains a lot of this in his serial killer profiling um, at the oliphantinstitute.com. So you should, guys should definitely check it out. The classes are amazing. I've taken several myself, so of my co-host, and um, they're $20 a pop. It's like it's so simple, and it's a one-day, you know, less than an hour class, and you still get some great information. So if you're kind of one of those, you know, armchair detectives or, or what they're calling, um, you know, web sleuths or um, civilian detectives and you're just you don't really care about getting a, a, a degree but you'd like to actually get some information you should totally go check it out and the link to that will be in our show notes down below so you guys can definitely go over there I highly recommend starting with the serial killer 101 and 102 it's very informative and you'll learn a lot about um, serial killer profiling so and um, which by the way if I'm sorry which, by the way, we have 101 coming up this Saturday and then 102 following the next Saturday. Interesting you mentioned that because we do have those coming up the next two weekends. Right, right. And, they, and they're usually on the weekend. So it's, you know, something that you can do in your spare time. He, you know, he's got different time slots and everything. So it's a, it's a really great little deal there, guys. And I really highly, highly recommend it. I am currently in the human decomposition um, and homicide um, course, which is going to be what, five episodes, Stephen? Yes, there's five episodes of that. Yeah. Uh, starting with part one all the way through part five. And we're going to have a follow-up that's not part of the five-part series, uh, but it's going to be sort of a sort of a part of it, but not really, on homicide and entomology, where we dig deep Ooh. into the bug aspect of where are we in this homicide. Yeah, I like that. That's cool. All right, so getting back to the, the Golden State Killer, though, that's what we're talking about with Stephen David Lampley today. Anne Wolbert Burgess was a psych psychiatric nursing professor at Boston College who studied the personalities of 36 different um, convicted serial killers in the late 1970s, early 1980s, so like during the time period that this was happening, um, with FBI agents in the Behavioral Science Unit. And she said serial criminals commonly develop a preoccupation preoccupation with their crime at an early age. So do you think the fact that um, D'Angelo had to watch his own seven-year-old sister being raped by two men on an Air Force base in Germany at the age of nine created this really kind of type of modus operandi and the obsession with rape? Um, do you think it played into what he did to the men he was terrorizing as well and making them listen while incapacitated to do anything to, while he's doing what he wanted with their loved one? Do you think that played a big part in that? It very well could have. I, I don't know. And I don't, I have not read his psychological eval, so I mm -hmm. don't know uh, the particulars of that. But yes, it very well could have. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine that something like that, I mean, it seems like it would be kind of indicative of it being that, you know, at nine, you would have no way to stop a person from doing something to your loved one. So he's kind of like creating this and what he was doing with his male victims of putting the, you know, having them be tied up by, by their wife, you know, or their loved one, putting the dishes on his back. And so that, you know, telling him if you move, I'm going to kill her, the whole thing, you know, I think that that, I, I would think it would definitely be something that set him up for that yeah right. yeah so so I also know you're a supporter of the death penalty and um is it is it disappointing to you that the case was pled out to life without the possibility of parole even given though the fact that the age of the convicted probably wouldn't have even been worth it going through it or he might not even have sub sub sustained the trial but is it upsetting with something so heinous like this that there's absolutely like he just gets to sit and, and live his life out as long as he is there. Is that upsetting well, I, in any and way? I am, I am a support. I'm a, I'm a police, police officer. So, you know, that right. for the most part goes along with the territory. Yes, I am right. a supporter of the death penalty. But on the flip side of that, mm -hmm. and this may sound crass, right. uh, you know, if you, if you allow someone to, to live and sit with this, the rest mm -hmm. of their life, mm -hmm. is that more punishment than the death penalty or vice versa? Sure, sure, 
Sure. I almost feel like the death penalty gives swift justice to the families, but not necessarily, but it kind of gives the ser the killer, you know, uh, a quick out, you know, it's like the weaselly way out, you know, but um, the thing that I find unsettling about this is that beyond the opening statements that were given by the prosecutors, we're never going to actually get to see like all the evidence in the case. And, you know, we talk about the DNA being a big part of this, like, the families won't even get to see that beyond the fact that they're say, being told, yes, the DNA links to him, they won't get to see any of the other evidence. And that's, you know, that's kind of upsetting. Do you think that there's a case, though, for the media to file a lawsuit to have the information unsealed under, like, the Freedom of Information Act? That, that being civil, I, I don't know. I don't know what California law provides. <clears throat> I, I'll be honest. Uh, if, if, if I was a family member of, uh, and, and I'm a, I've been a police officer for 21 years. Mm -hmm. uh, if I was a family member of one of the victims, I don't care about the evidence. Right. Just I, that he got I, the I, conviction. I don't, I don't care. Yeah. But again, you know, some of the family members would probably want to see that. Do they have a right to? I think they probably should have a right to. But again, mm -hmm. I don't know how, how the laws are in California. What they're gonna have yeah. To do that. Yeah, I know I've seen it done before um, in other cases where they filed after something like this happens, mm -hmm. but with something this comprehensive, I, I mean, there's a case to be made for both sides, I think, you know, um, I think the public would like to know more about it and how he was actually, you know, captured and, and, and put to, you know, through this, especially considering that it's kind of relatively newer technology that was being used, mm -hmm. you know, to do this. Um, and, and the use of genealogy data to find a murder suspect has raised privacy questions. So um, right now the police, they, they're, you know, they're saying that they're currently using these techniques to find murderers and, and people, but, are, but you know, it's been raised by um, researcher Yanev Ehrlich to um, NPR's Rob Stein in 2018. Are we okay with using this technology to identify people in political demonstrations who left their DNA behind? Which is interesting considering that that's kind of what we're having happen right now. So um, there are many scenarios that, that, can, that you can think of that could be misused, but what do you think of this? And why is this technology like this not more widely used? Is it because of the privacy concerns? Well, there has been a significant cutback, as I understand, mm -hmm. that they're not allowing full use of this DNA as they once did. Mm -hmm. uh, and I look at it like fingerprints or mm -hmm. iris ID or, or, or anything like that. Right. It's new and it's different and people are scared of it. And yes, you can dig deep and you can find people. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is an, it is an exceptional uh, tool we've never had before. And we have put away, I say we, as a collective unit, law enforcement has been able to identify and put away a lot of violent, uh, violent criminals because of this DNA that right. otherwise go running around the streets. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things we talked about, and I made a mistake last time, I'm going to correct it here. When I was talking with Kirk Nurmi, I had said um, that there was some issues, you know, with the thoughts process of DNA, which we didn't think before there would be issues with DNA. DNA was pretty conclusive, but there were some issues. And I said, I had attributed it to like a blood transfusion. That was not the correct thing. Tori, um, one of our co-hosts and, and producers had brought up the fact that um, things like, um, uh, transplants and stuff like that um, have been now shown to possibly be altering DNA. So I'm wondering if you think that's going to be a problem moving forward. Well, again, I'm, and I'm not a DNA expert, but I think that there, there's, and I don't know if there are some methods to bypass. I, mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, right. That's why we have DNA experts. But yeah, I, I exactly. Want to, some way to identify that ecologically go back and get a medical history when you can. Dave, you had right. a transfusion. Sometimes, right. no, that's not possible, not feasible. Right. Yeah, uh, I had not even heard that it was something that happened, but now I guess it's starting to come out. I, I think we'll have to talk with uh, someone like Joseph Scott Morgan or one of our forensic criminologists that'll have a little more information on that be, as, as to how that would play into things. Because, gosh, I just would hate for that to become a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Even fingerprints now, they've been they've come out to say that yes, it would be 
almost impossibly, you know, impossible to happen. It would be extremely rare. It's not so extremely rare to think that maybe someone else would have the same pattern, which we all thought that that was not possible. But having the same pattern and being in the same area at the same time, and that would be complete, uh, very impo improbable, you know. But I guess in some strange occurrence, it could happen, which is which is crazy to me, you know, because we've been using that for a long time, you know. So, yeah, well, there's, there's been so many uh, different ideas, tongue prints, for mm -hmm. instance, fingerprints, iris mm -hmm. ID, uh, handprints, facial prints, structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and there's been so many variables, but DNA has proven itself to be a very reliable right. uh, Garden State killer, for instance, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a this is a, a tremendous instrument. We've just got to come to some kind of uh, common ground between the people that don't like it and the effectiveness mm -hmm. of a tool for law enforcement. Right, right. I mean, yes, it can be a privacy concern, I guess, in some ways, especially mm -hmm. when you're getting into something like familia DNA that is a little less 100% um, conclusive, you know, or mitochondrial DNA. But like, you know, I think that the, the pros of it far outweigh the cons, you know, uh, in, in bringing some of these people to justice. So in August, the actual sentencing is going to take place. And at that time, the victims have the ability to speak out. They've already said some things. Um, you know, it was, it was made into memes of, of, you know, one of the victims saying that he had a small penis, you know, and how that was, you know, funny. But, uh, yeah. but the judge has put no time restrictions or really any restrictions on what the victims can get to say. So is that common or is that something even more unique to something like this type of case? Well, I can't speak for every court and every judge, but with, with this case, I fully understand him giving, him, giving them unlimited time. This, is, yeah. this has been going on for decades, decades and decades. And these families have kept up and kept up and, and begged and pleaded and searched and hunted and investigated some of them themselves, trying to find out who mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. killed their family members, their friends, or their, or their you know, mom, dad, right. brother, sister, whatever. So let them have their time. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is one of the cases that, you know, it seems like it should have been solved so much sooner. Um, that was one of the things that uh, Michelle McNamara, who wrote All Be Gone in the Dark, said, you know, she was like, the thing that intrigued her the most was it just seemed so solvable, but yet it had not been, you know, and so it was just so, so odd. But the East Area rapist attacks happened while D'Angelo was still a cop. And when he was arrested for shoplifting and fired from the force, he told his brother-in-law he had ideas of killing the police chief. So as a former police officer, does all of this bother you? And do you think it had any impact on how he was able to evade being found for all those years? You're talking about his, uh, his uh, being a police officer to being able yes. to evade? Sure. Yeah, because sure. between 1973 yeah. and 79, while he was the East Area Rapist, he was a police officer. So. Yeah, obviously he did. He, he knew the, uh, the techniques and the, and the methods of police. Sure, it had an impact. Uh, how much of an impact? I don't know. But obviously, if you know how police investigate a case, you know their processes, yeah, you're going to be able to uh, go around some of those and avoid some of those and be able to. Mm -hmm not get caught. But you also have to understand that organized serial killers typically have a, just by the nature, a, usually a higher IQ than their disorganized counterparts. Uh, mm -hmm. And you'll find that the, also, and I cover this in, in the class, Serial Killer 102, I think it is, mm -hmm. that when you, the more, the more kills typically now, there's always exceptions, but when you have a serial killer, and the more kills, the more murders that they're able to make, typically there's a correlation between the number of murders and the IQ. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In other words, right. you're going to have to be a little sharper to avoid yeah. being caught after 10 murders than after one. Uh, right, right. So, right. Well, my yeah, husband has always said, you know, the only criminals that are in prison are the dumb criminals, you know, like, so, because to get caught, you know, if you're, if you're a smart enough criminal, you, you can evade, you know, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're smart enough and you plan it well enough that, and that's, um, and that's typical of, you know, the serial killers. I think that there's more serial killers out there right now, even than we, than we know, you know, um, I, oh, yes. A lot of people yeah. think that, oh, it, it kind of phased out a lot in the 70s and 80s. And I don't think so. But I think that it's taking a different, um, 
the serial killer has changed over time as things have changed. You know, we, we have, we, have, we evolve over time, you know, and as the law enforcement evolves, so do the serial killers, you know, to change. Um, but do you feel like some of these types of um, sociopaths and psychopaths who, who, you know, typically end up in this category of social, serial killer are able to hide inside of jobs that are, that are similar to like law enforcement, um, maybe because of the, the detachment that they have to employ for, you know, investigations or analytical things like that. Do you think they're able to hide easier in that? I, I don't think so. No, I don't think it's a, an easier environment in law enforcement. Matter of fact, it may be a little harder because okay. you have people, you have people that are trained mm -hmm. to observe, you know, behavior and trained to observe things. And if you're working with somebody like that, and they they can read you, mm -hmm. you're setting yourself open. And that's that's a, that's a very minute uh, example. But yeah, I, I think it would be easier. And I, if I remember right, the stats on serial killer op, uh, employment are, mm -hmm. are nominal as far as law enforcement. Uh, right. More so actually in the military, I think. Right. And a lot of them seek out careers that are similar, like you said, military, or as in the case of Ted Bundy, he wanted to become a lawyer. Some of mm -hmm. them, you know, have failed out of, um, of fail failing like a psych exam or whatever like that for becoming part of it. It's interesting that they, a lot of them gravitate towards wanting to have that type of career while... Yeah, yeah kind of falling away from it in a way of their own you know it's kind of interesting I'm like that's odd that's a little odd you know um also once he lost his job as um in the east area um area um the east area rape stopped and D'Angelo moved with his wife and children to southern California where he was then you know um started beginning to go from rape into murder do you think him being fired um, had anything to do with him escalating his crimes to to that? Do you think that had anything to do with it? Like maybe kind of he was angry of, and wanting to stick it to the police officers in a different way? Do you think it just made him, you know, triggered something? What, what do you think caused him to end up into this realm of he raped for a long time and then mm -hmm. began to really kind of go into something different? Well, it certainly could have been a trigger, a stressor. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. well, there's a, as a, you know, was the serial killing or killers, excuse me, were the murders uh, precipitated by a stressor? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, yes, mm -hmm. that's exactly what happens. And at other times, no, it's just an urge. Uh, I just need to kill again. Nothing really happened. But sometimes a serial killer may, may be fired, uh, evicted, divorced, dumped uh, by a girlfriend. I think mm -hmm. Ted Bundy was an example of that. Uh, he never, never really recovered from that. Uh, I can't think of her name. Dumping him. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's always there's almost always a stressor in some respects. Except, well, not always. In, in with with some serial killers, but there are some that not, really doesn't matter. They're they're just right. going to kill for the thrill of it. Mm -hmm. But in this case, yeah, it certainly could have. Definitely. Yeah, his brother-in-law talks about um, him never getting over uh, a girlfriend before, uh, you know, Bonnie before his Bonnie, wife, yeah. Sharon. Yeah, and that makes me wonder if something there, you know, we don't know a whole lot about that relationship, um, and I'm wondering if that is, if that played into this, mm -hmm. um, and I definitely think that he had almost like a taunting um, the whole time with the police, even being inside the police department and thinking, ha ha, you can't catch me. But then when the press released that he had never broken into home with a man present, um, it was almost like a hold my beer kind of moment because he was like, oh, really? Oh, OK. And so that's when he started doing the parts where you right. know he had the men present and he started breaking in. And I think it was like, you know, almost a taunting that he had going on, that he is enjoying this. And I wonder if even after leaving, you know, kind of stopping what he did, which was very interesting to me that he was able to kind of control this. How, have you seen that before where they, they really are at some point in time able to get this under control and they go for, you know, decades without actually doing anything? Oh yeah. Yeah. Serial killers don't, you know, they, it doesn't necessarily precipitate and build and build and build exponentially. Sometimes they can go for years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then stop. And, and, and I hate to keep going back to Jeffrey Dahmer, but he's sort of a, 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 a different kind, a different kind of guy. Jeffrey mm -hmm. Dahmer. Most serial killers don't want to quit. They really don't. They, they enjoy the kill. They enjoy the necrophilia, mm -hmm. or whatever it is that motivates them to to murder. Jeffrey didn't enjoy that. 
Jeffrey right. did not enjoy it. He tried to quit. He actually mm -hmm. tried when he moved in with his grandmother. Uh, and so for that period of time, although it was slow, and for the tier period of time that he was in the army, at least we suspect that he stopped murders, mm -hmm. although there's a question about some murders in Germany. In but, Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there are serial killers that will go for years uh, with a cooling off period before they kill again or, or may never kill again. Hmm. Um, yeah, it kind of reminds me, like you say, that uh, the Dahmer was so different uh, in wanting that he wanted to stop. It reminds me a lot of one of my, um, the ones that I'm fascinated by, which was Kemper. You know, Kemper turned himself in. Like, he, he's just like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do yeah. this anymore. Um, and then there was a story, and I don't remember what, which serial killer it was, but Laura Jacqueline Brand told us when we first interviewed her back many, many months ago, um, that there was a serial killer that she interviewed that literally walked into a police station with a woman's breast in his hand and said, please help me stop doing this. And I was like, oh my God, what a crazy thing that is. Like just to walk in holding this woman's, you know, body part, especially a breast in his hand and be like, please stop me, stop me from doing this, which is. You know, I, I, I know I said a lot, don't want to quit. They don't, most, most of them enjoy the, the thrill yes. of the lust, the thrill of the kill, the thrill of the Definitely torture. Bundy did. But, yeah, definitely Bundy But there did. are killers that want to be caught, such as mm -hmm. uh, Kemper mm -hmm. and others. They they want to stop. Bundy, excuse me, Dahmer wanted to stop. He just mm -hmm. didn't have the ability. And when he was finally arrested, he said, mm -hmm. now it stops. And now, right. now it, it, I'm, right. I feel better. It's, it stopped. Uh, and in case, another case that's sort of a little different is the serial killer, the Claremont killer that I arrested. Mm -hmm. uh, he left California, moved to Birmingham, which is where I ran into him. Mm -hmm. He literally walked in to the precinct where I was working the desk mm -hmm. uh, under, under a different premise. But nonetheless, you're a serial killer. You don't walk into a police department, period. Lord, no, 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 obviously <laughs> not. And yeah, I was just, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'd rather hear you speak uh, than me. <laughs> I was just saying, there, there are, most serial killers don't stop and won't stop. Right. But there are some that they just, they're just done with it. And right. They realize that, and, and part, of the, uh, part of the process, the psychological process of serial killers, is that they, they get this aura about them and they start developing, and this is not for both organized and disorganized, but for one or the other, or both depending on, on the process. Uh, they get this aura about them that they start regressing into themselves and they go through this mental process about finding someone and going through this uh, whole process of trying to identify someone. Uh, and they, at the end, they go into this depression phase because what set them off to start this, this one particular murder of this instance was the need to satisfy something inside them, yeah. whatever it was, a, a bad childhood, uh, mm -hmm. sex need and when they finish and they made when they killed the victim they fall into this very deep depression and they realize that didn't work right this so then they do it again work. and they're going to have to go back at some point and do right. it again so they and keep it's chasing it's almost like a high that they're chasing it's like a drug right. you know um so you've profiled several serial killers and how do you think it's possible for several of them to live such ordinary lives with um, wives and children, um, it, it just—it just wonder. It's I, like the happy face killer. I think of him. I think of Bundy with Elizabeth and her daughter. You know, and um, sev a BTK. I think it was BTK. Was it BTK that also had a family as well? I think. Um, you know, there were several of them that I can think of that had normal relationships with wives and especially with daughters that really just blow me away for these men that, you know, rape and murder young girls. Like, how is that possible for them to do this? Well, they, they have a type, again, Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer had a type. This is who mm -hmm. I'm looking for. This is the type of person I'm looking for. Uh, mm -hmm. And they have, most of them have types. Now, disorganized usually don't. But they're disorganized serial killers are usually loners. They're usually mm -hmm. live alone. They don't have right. a family or close family. So uh, had if there was a disorganized serial killer that was with close family, might they kill their family? Of course they might. Of course. Right. But you're going to find that most of these uh, organized serial killers have a type that they're looking mm -hmm. for. Uh, mm -hmm. And they look for that, that particular uh, type of individual. 
So it's not somebody that they would have a relationship with. Is the type is not the same. Yeah. So no. they're able to. No, is it almost like a compartmentalization that you think goes on there? Well, I don't know if it's that so much as, as it is just that my daughter or my son or my mo my mom or my mm -hmm. wife just doesn't. That's not the victim. That's not who I'm looking for. Right. Uh, right. You no, know, for instance, like John Wayne Gacy, he had a family. He was not mm -hmm. interested. Because his his type was young boys. Right. So he didn't have an interest in his wife or, or anybody else. Mm -hmm. So that's the way with a lot of serial killers. They have a type they're looking for. It just seems like it would be so hard to like go out, kill a guy and then come home and, and have steaks on the, on the grill. Oh, yeah. like, like it just, you know, or lay down next to your wife or take your daughter to the park. It just seems like that would be such a hard thing for them to do. But I mean, many of them do. What else do you think about, um, even in this case, D'Angelo, you know, he's claimed that there's a personality Jerry inside of him that made him do it or whatever. What do you think of that, that a lot of these violent um, offenders will tend to claim something like that, even though there's not any real like DID issue going on or anything, but they're kind of, is that a way for them to lay the blame somewhere else or well, some are psychotic. There are some serial killers that are psychotic. And, but you have to understand a lot of people, uh, a lot of people believe that serial killers are either horribly insane or intelligent beyond all means. And that's not true. Matter of fact, a very, very small percentage of serial killers are insane. That doesn't right. mean they don't have some kind of mental uh, development issue. Mm -hmm. a borderline personality disorder or something doesn't mm -hmm. mean, but that's not insanity. And that's not dissociative uh, identity disorder either. No, right. No. And that, and, you know, that's one of the things that I've always, th always thought was the problem with the insanity plea, like to, for, for them to even, and it's hard enough to get an insanity plea, first of all, but second of all, I almost am like, what is the point of this? I mean, obviously, clearly anyone who is taking another person's life, like unless they're in self-defense, is clearly not quite there. I mean, it just would seem to me that they would all be in some level of, you know, not right, obviously, but not necessarily, like you said, like totally insane or, you know, all these things. The definition of insanity is that you, that what you think you're doing is fine. It's mm -hmm. perfectly fine at the right. instant that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer again, uh, mm -hmm. they knew what they were doing was wrong. Right. Did it anyway. So that's not insanity. Insanity. Right. Uh, right. Right. Uh, the one case that I've thought of that that really clearly defined an insanity to me was a woman actually of um, that killed her husband who had abused her for you know tons and tons of years. And when she killed him, um, then she chopped up his whole body. And the idea behind it was when she was explaining that it wasn't like she was chopping it up to like dispose of a body or or get away with a crime or anything. She was actually doing it because she was taking away the power that each one of those pieces of his body had over her so for instance you know I cut his hands off so he couldn't punch me anymore I cut his mouth mm -hmm. off you know I head off so he couldn't scream at me anymore I cut his legs off so he couldn't kick me that was the one clear case that I was like this woman is clearly you know disturbed in a way that you know because she took his life and then began to dismember him thinking that he's uh, taking his life wasn't good enough to keep him from doing the things that he had done to her, you know? So that was a clear case for me that was very, I understood an insanity plea in that, even with like um, Andrea Yates who killed all of her children, you know, definitely insanity plea makes a sense to me in that realm. But, but some of these things like, you know, uh, we were asked a lot in um, the Gypsy Rose Blanchard case, why Nick didn't take an insanity plea. And I'm like, because he's not insane. Uh, just because he thinks there's a 500 year old vampire living inside of him does not make him insane. He's not insane. You know, when you think about putting somebody in a mental institution for the criminally insane, those people are really insane. Like, yeah. I want to wear your skin insane, you know, not like, you know, oh, I just very violently killed somebody and I pretend that there's a person inside of me. That's not the same thing. 
So, well, anyway, thank you so much for coming on today and talking about the Golden State Killer with us today. We really appreciate it. Your information is always so, so great and concise. And I always appreciate how long you take to explain everything with us. So uh, we'll be having Stephen back again uh, to talk about other things soon. And um, eventually I'd like to get into the case that you're, you're kind of working on right now this, uh, this investigation that you're doing in Tennessee. And I'm really excited mm -hmm. about learning more about that case from you. Um, do you want to take a few minutes to just kind of talk about it a little bit for yourself? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Uh, th this case happened. I have, let me back up. I have worked a lot of cases over the 21 years I was in law enforcement, mm -hmm. uh, physically actually had my hands on a lot of cases. And I came across the case of uh, Kathy Jones doing research for another book, uh, Cold Case Abduction and Murder, back in 1934 in Nashville. Uh, wow. And I come across the case of Kathy Jones, and it was interesting to me. Uh, and I, I printed out some information, put it in a file folder, and sort of set it aside, and I pretty much forgot about it. And I went back one day, I was going cleaning up my desk, which is stacked full of papers and various research uh, things. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, okay, let me sit back and read it. And this case has impacted me more than any ever, any other case mm -hmm. I've ever actually had my hands on. This girl, this 12 year old girl uh, was living in poverty. She never had anything. Uh, she mm -hmm. never wore new clothes. She never knew what it was like to get new clothes or wear new clothes. And she had, gotten a pair of skates from her cousin that were used, but to her, they were the grandest thing ever. They, it was, she was just beside herself. Uh, long story short, she did some chores around the house that Saturday, November 29th, 1969. And uh, her mom said, well, you know, go to, the, go to the skating rink. Here's a dollar. You earned a dollar. Go to the, take yourself to the skating rink, 55 cents mm -hmm. to get in, get yourself a donut or two. And when you get ready to come home, call me. Mm -hmm. Well, she never received the phone call, right. but Kathy never made it to Krispy Kreme or to the skating rink. She was abducted, very violently tortured, mm -hmm. and subsequently murdered and dumped at an empty lot. <sighs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to spring this on you. Right next to her skates that she never right. got to use. Uh, right. So, the book was originally scheduled to come out the 20th this month. It's not going to. Mm -hmm. I have received some more information that I'm going to investigate. Uh, and we, you and I have talked about actually going to the scene yep. in Nashville and, and doing some filming, which we will do. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, this case, and I agree with the investigators in Nashville, this case is solvable. Yeah. Just need that one piece. Mm -hmm. That's There's so often we... And so often we do in so many cases, you know, it's just that one piece that's missing. And I hope that you're able to find some justice for, for little Kathy. I've read a little bit about what's, what the case is. It's, it's a heartbreaking case. I mean, all cases in some ways are sad or, you know, upsetting, but this one is one of the ones that it just, it just hits you right here, you know, and and it kind of sticks with you. It's not a case that you just thought, you know, walk away. I think about um, John Douglas's book, The Cases That Haunt Us, you know, when, when mm -hmm. you're thinking about this. And there are some cases that, that it just happens. For me, it's um, the Delphi murders. We had talked about that, you know, the young ladies in Indiana that's sure. very close to where I am. And, and um, we're working with Joseph um, Scott Morgan on something with that one, you know. But um, mm -hmm. I definitely am glad that you're, co you're taking time to work on this case. And I can't wait to, you know, go down to Nashville with you and, and kind of walk the scene and find out more about what you're doing. And we're definitely going to do um, a giveaway at some point in time time with an autographed um, uh, book from Stephen, his new book that he's writing about this. So you guys be looking out for that once he, you know, finishes this and we'll do some different stuff on it. But again, thank you, Stephen. I know that was a, I quickly, quickly pulled you on that one. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to like you know, just throw it at you. But uh, it's a case that I, I think is, is something that needs a lot more attention, you know, and a lot more eyes on it to, to get you that piece of information that you're missing. To solve this one. If I make have time to say one more thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the the book, and I want to tell you already know, but I want to tell mm -hmm. uh, your viewers that yeah. this book uh, entitled "12 and Murdered" about Kathy Jones 
I have set it up. I, I'm receiving zero royalties. I don't want any royalties. Right. Uh, and I'm doing that because I want to keep the price of the book as absolute low as possible. And the reason why is I want this book to get out in as many hands of as many people as I can, because as a police officer, I know sometimes it's just the little tiniest bit of information somebody knows that they think is so trivial, trivial and unimportant but it makes or breaks a case. So I want this right. book to get out to as many people as possible. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm receiving nothing on this book. I don't want anything. And that's so admirable, you know, and, and the fact that that's what you're, you're ju- the justice is what you're looking for, nothing else, sure. you know. And, and you're right. A lot of times it is the small details, but that will break a case wide open. And it's oftentimes something that someone doesn't even realize that they right. knew. You know, they look at something and they go, oh, wait a minute, I, I did know this. And Mm-hmm. I didn't even think to tell somebody this, you know, and that's often what um, breaks a case open. So sure. again, Stephen, thank you so much for um, joining us. We will be updating you guys as that, as he works through that book and, you know, we walk and, and look at the crime scene there in Tennessee, since it's just a hop, skip and a jump across the way for me. Um, but we'll go ahead and, and do so. So thank you again. Um, have a wonderful rest of your weekend and we look forward to having you on again. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to join you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Have a good one. Hey guys. So a couple nights ago, we launched a special campaign along with Cheryl McCollum from the Cold Case Research Institute called Love Wins. And what this is, is it is our answer to all the chaos that's kind of going on right now. Um, The chaos from the riots, the chaos from all the different, you know, pandemic, everything that's happening in our lives right now, uh, all the the issues with, you know, the different lost lives that we've had from before the protesting, after the protesting. So all the lost lives that have come out of this, uh, the lost lives of COVID even. And so hashtag love wins is a movement to usher in peace. And knowing that above all, the only way that we're going to get through all of this is loving each other. So what we're at, what we're actually doing here is we are creating a scholarship fund in remembrance of all the lost lives in 2020 so far and ushering in peace. And this scholarship fund will go to anyone that wants to go ahead and, and enter to win. Um, the criteria is really cool. All you have to do is make a 30 second video of yourself and explaining to us how you lead with love. And we are looking for college age students that are, you know, struggling. Maybe they can't get scholarships. Maybe they, there's a reason, you know, that they aren't available for them or it's just not enough for them. And so this is our way of helping out. We're hoping to raise about $5,000. If we raise more than that, uh, then we'll look into giving more than one scholarship away. The way that we're doing this is we have some merchandise. It's hashtag love wins merchandise. And there's also lead with love merchandise. Uh, They've got shirts, cups, mugs, stickers, anything you could possibly want. And we're going to have it on a couple different platforms. Currently, we're doing some on Tee Public, but I'm working on some on Cafe Press too, because they have a lot more variety of uh, merchandise. And so we'll be donating a portion of the proceeds that we collect on this merchandise to the scholarship fund that we are creating. And then we also have a GoFundMe that will be listed in the show notes of our YouTube show and our podcast. And you guys can click on it and you can donate any amount you'd like. And all of the proceeds from that are going to go ahead and go to the scholarship fund. And we'll be showing you exactly how the money is distributed, how it's collected. We're going to be very transparent with this. We're working with some amazing professionals that, um, you know, from like Cheryl from the Cold Case Institute, Stephen David Lampley from the Oliphant Institute, uh, the leading death investigator, Joseph Scott Morgan. So we're, we're working with all of them to really show how much love wins over everything and bringing peace to a country that really, we really need it right now. So 
that's what we're doing. And we're going to go ahead and play our entries at the top of every podcast and every YouTube until we choose a winner. And our special guests that we have each week, uh, you know, the different people that come on and, and are here with us, Cheryl and Stephen and Joseph, they'll all be a part of choosing that lucky winner or winners, depending on how much we end up getting donated. So I hope that you guys join us in hashtag love wins. And we hope that we get some really great entrance because we really want to see how you lead with love. Well, thanks so much for tuning in and dishing true crime with the good wives and murder by design. Don't forget to join our Patreon member club to get exclusive mini episodes, inside documents and pictures from the case, live YouTube discussions, our exclusive discussion group on Facebook, and get some amazing good wives merch. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at True Crime Wives. And for more inside information, check out our podcast, The Good Wives Guide to True Crime, on any of your favorite podcast players. Have a good one from The Good Wives, serving up true crime one dish at a time.